Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Studio 78 podcast. I am your host, Nishe Snow, and you can find me over at nishesnow.com. That is N as in Nancy, A C H E S N O W.com. This is episode 32, and this is also season two of the Studio 78 podcast. I'm really excited. I took the summer off just to have a little bit of fun. It's kind of hilarious, though, because when I was recording the intro just now, I was like, what am I supposed to say? So I actually had to listen to an older episode just to figure out, like, what do I normally say in the beginning? So you know it's been way too long. Anyway, thank you for joining me again. And if you're new to the podcast, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I have an amazing uh, artist on today, a textile artist and graphic designer named Utende, excuse me, Utunde Rodriguez, and I'm really excited to introduce her to you. This season, I have a variety of women from different backgrounds, some doing what they love full time and some doing it as a side hustle. So I really think you guys are going to enjoy just a variety of stories that I'm bringing to you this season. Uh, Some are just, you know, people who I've been stalking on Instagram for a while and I just wanted to talk to them and pick their brain. Some contacted me and some are recommendations from you guys. So So keep them recommendations coming, please, please, please. Uh, Let's see, what else is going on? I had uh, an amazing summer, lots and lots of travel, which is why I decided to take a little bit of time off from the podcast. But one thing that I have been working on is a journal, and it's called The Life Cleanse. And I'm hoping to have it out really, really soon. Um, I'm really excited about it. It's just um, a journal Uh, that I've created with the questions that through the years I've asked myself and these questions have helped me kind of center myself and figure out like what direction I should go in, um, be it in my career or life or when it comes to my creative endeavors or traveling more or whatever it might be. So it's kind of like my brain and how, (laughs) which is scary, but how I like figure things out in my life, um, put into a book and it's meant for you know, for people to just have it and then redo it. Like, you know, you might fill this book out right now, this journal out right now, but maybe six months from now or a year from now, you might get another one and fill that out. And then eventually, you know, on your bookshelf, you'll have like a sense of where you were in different points in time. Cause I feel like, um, I have journals now from when I was in high school and it's always interesting to see like what I was thinking in high school and what I was writing down when I was in college and after college, because it just gives you a sense of like how you've grown over time. So I'm hoping that this journal does the same, but also just helps you like figure out like where you are right now. So you can figure out where you want to go. Anyway, if you want to be notified about when it is up for sale, please go over to Nish snow.com slash journal and voila you can sign up and I will let you know when it comes out and I'll probably give you a little discount code too anyway all right so let's just dive right into today's episode as I've already told you, it is Yutunde Rodriguez she's a textile artist a graphic designer a maker of all things I just love her stuff. She uses um, African kind of patterns and symbols and puts them on home decor, things like pillows, and then the products are absolutely beautiful. Anyway, today we're just talking about her story in general, some lessons learned and kind of where she is right now. But like three big things that I just want to touch on really quickly that I want you guys to listen for in the story is in the beginning as she's telling about her start. I think it's just a great example of how you know, no one's beginnings is like absolutely perfect where you know exactly what you want to do. So you'll see like how she talks about going to college, but then deciding to go into the Navy. And then after the Navy, like how things like morph and shift. And so, you know, I think all of us have those periods where we're just trying to figure out like, what do I, what do I want to be right when I grow up? So um, in the beginning, she kind of touches on like just her initial journey. And then she, you know, in the 
middle of the conversation, we're talking about how she went from making like handmade body soaps to becoming more of a textile designer and how she like taught herself this textile design because this was before like there were things online that would like help you with these type of things. Like we talk about spoon flour and some other things like that. But um, so hearing like what made her shift, how she shifted and then how she marketed herself is very interesting. And then the last big thing was just like pricing. And I think no matter what industry you're in, no matter what you're doing, I think figuring out like what you're worth or what you're making is worth is always like so difficult. And, you know, she talks about how she's just now seeing herself really as an artist and like some things that she takes into account when she's like really trying to figure out like how to price her worth or excuse me, price her products. So yeah, so it was just a great conversation with an artist that I really love. And I think there's some, um, really interesting like stories in here. So I hope that you find it as interesting as I do. So yeah, so without further ado, uh, let's, uh, jump right in. Here's your tune day. Hello, everybody. Welcome, Yatunde. I'm really excited to have her on. She's a graphic designer and textile artist. Welcome, 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 Yatunde. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing to come on. Well, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I um, reached out to a ton of people last or over the last week for the second season of the Studio 78 podcast. And you are like at the top of my list of people who um, I wanted to talk to. So I was really excited oh when you God. got back to Thank me. So much. I'm so flattered. Like, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk a little old me? <laughs> <laughs> but just to um, help the audience get to know you a little bit better, can you just tell them a little bit about like your background, your story? Sure, sure. Well, okay, so once again, my name is Yutunde. You might be wondering where that's from. Some of y'all might know it. Um, I'm, I was actually born in Nigeria, and I lived in Nigeria till I was a young teen, and then we moved to the U.S., um, and I've been here ever since. This is, like, most of my life. Um, so, but yeah, that's, it, it, so if you're hearing an accent, that's why. Um, <laughs> and then... Then you couple that with my last name, Rodriguez, which would be my husband, Danny, which shout out, today's our 17th anniversary. So I just had to quickly put that in there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he's Dominican, of course. Um, but anyway, yeah, so um, I grew up here mostly in America. Um, and of course, as most children of immigrants know, especially West African, your only career options are doctor or lawyer and, or engineer, really, doctor or engineer. So growing up, it was always understood that I was going to go into something like medicine. And I went, went along with the program. So I got to high school. Then I was like, um, yeah, I don't think so. This, <laughs> this is not going to happen. So then we stepped it down to nurse. Well, that didn't happen either. Um, so I actually started college the first time, uh, as a nursing major. And then, um, I discovered partying, you know, and that, <laughs> you know, didn't work out well. And then I joined the Navy for mm. five years. So yeah, I was in the Navy. After the Navy, I, um, I went to, I had the opportunity to go back to college. Um, the, the plan was, I was going to be sent to college, um, get my degree, and go back in as a naval officer. Mm -hmm. Well, while I was in college, I I went to Hampton University, and I got there and I I studied graphic design. And I was just like, oh my gosh! Well, actually, I wanted to study interior design. They didn't have that, mm -hmm. um, but this was back in the day where you didn't have access to like online catalogs and stuff. So mm -hmm. the picture I had said they had interior design. But I get there and they didn't. They were phasing it out. So oh. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, um, graphic design, I guess. I don't know. I'm not sure what that is, but okay. So I studied it and I really loved it. That's when I really tapped into my artistic uh, side. And I just, I became, you know, artist with a small A. And then I decided <laughs> I want to go back in the Navy. So I got out of my contract and... 
uh, started doing everything else under the sun. And, you know, the next few years after that, my creativity just like blossomed. I was doing everything under the sun. Like I, I, I made soap and body products for years. Um, I did that as a business when we lived in Virginia. Um, did that, but I found myself being more interested in the designing of the labels and the packaging and all that stuff. Then I loved making the soaps and stuff, but I really, really loved doing the designing. Mm. Uh, it. So I spent a lot of time. My husband was like, you're always changing up your labels, always changing your logo. <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> And because that's where your, I guess, like your passion really lied. Like it was like, oh yeah, I have these products, but man, I okay. just want to decide like what tissue paper to use and exactly. like what colors and like yeah. <laughs> right, and I would get really into the nitty gritty. Like when I was in college, I even we had to create a product and design stuff for it, and I actually figured a way to feed tissue paper into my printer so mm. I could put my own custom. <laughs> It was crazy. Oh, yeah. So, you're a true creative because you're like yeah. experimenting with everything. Yep. Now, well, that's the funnest part of everything is experimentation. Yeah. Now, at this time, did you have, had you already met your husband? So were you married like by the time you had graduated college? Yeah, I met him just before I graduated, like literally weeks before graduation. Um, he had also been in the Navy because where we lived at the time was a big Navy town uh, mm. in Northern Virginia. So yeah. they had like, there's like seven bases in the area or could be more now along with other branches. So it's not, it's not uncommon to run into people who are either in or just got out. Mm. So yeah, we had both got out literally around the same time, but we met after we got out. So yeah, so we started dating and then, you know, on and on, and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So yeah. at that that time, you're, like, doing these, like, soaps and body products. Were you able to, like, do that, like, full-time? Like, was it making you, like, enough money where you didn't have to get a side gig? Or were you kind of, like, balancing it with other things? I did work. I, you know, I'm in and out of the workforce. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, but I've always, always wanted to work for myself. Like, you know, even when I was in college, I would look for ways to do things so that I could work for myself. Like, I remember I fell for this thing where, oh, you can as assemble hair barrettes from home. I sent off for my little kit and it came back and I tried so hard, but they never passed <laughs> the, the hair barrette. <laughs> so there was that. Uh, but right out of college, um, I didn't really, you know, I didn't, I never went to work in graphic design, strangely enough. Mm. I would always do it as a freelance thing for people, but I did every other job known to man. Like I went right into working for an insurance company. I hated it. Mm. Did again, hated it again. He did it again, hated it again. <laughs> so I've always like had some sort of, either if I'm not in a, in a real, like a quote unquote real job, um, mm -hmm. I'll have some sort of hustle. You know, I've been a notary, you know, back when, like, like in the early to mid 2000s when people were buying houses left and right or refining. Mm -hmm. I did the mobile notary thing and that was, that was pretty lucrative. But mm -hmm. then we all know what happened. I know. <laughs> so, but the market totally all, tanked. Yeah. Yeah. But through it all, I always had a product or something that I was working on, but I might have to like supplement. And to, you know, mostly it was because I stayed home with our kids. We have three children together mm -hmm. and uh, they're teenagers and preteens now. Um, so when they were really little, I would uh, be home with them. And but I always wanted to be doing something to bring in money. So, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. You know, doing something, but you know, I've had bouts of full on employment and was always miserable at it. But <laughs> <laughs> so then, how did um, kind of like your side business like morph over time? So, you're doing like the body soaps, you notice that you're loving more of the design aspect. So, like, what was you know, what did you start 
experimenting with next because like now of course I see that you do like these beautiful like home goods like pillows with these gorgeous <laughs> textile designs and so forth so how did you go from like body soap to doing uh home products um yeah that's a great question um so around the time that we moved here in 20 uh 2007 I live in Ohio now um well, a little bit before that, I had gotten a little disenchanted with the body products. Mm-hmm. Um, I get to a point with a lot of things that the when I feel like there's not much challenge there anymore, it's like, okay, I'm itching for something else. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. when I first started with the body products, it was literally like nobody was doing it except except like old grandmas, you know, <laughs> so making soap on the stove with ash and all that. So it was very exciting because it was something different. And um, we were realizing the benefits of natural ingredients and everything. And then after a while, with the rise of the Internet and people having access to information, which is a good thing, you know, mm-hmm. every- People got more and more into it. And so then companies uh, started taking note and started uh, offering um, the ingredients that the big boys use to the homemaker. Ah, mm-hmm. Yeah. So before you knew it, everybody and their mother could buy a lotion base, slap their na- label on it and say, oh, I, I make lotion or mm. you know, whatever. So uh, I was just. It, it was increasingly difficult to compete with um, people who were just buying and repackaging. Mm, but, mm, you know, that's mm-hmm. not even really the, the main issue. Like I said, it got saturated for me. I had learned about as much as I could about mm-hmm. it. So then when we moved here um, in 2007, that was kind of like a natural break point for me. So I kind of packed it up. But even then, at that point, I wasn't sure what else I was going to do. Mm-hmm. I started getting some idea because I was, I've was i always been fascinated with um, Adinkra symbols. So I was like, oh, I would love to see a line of home products, you know, in designs like Adinkra symbols. So mm. I started to explore that uh, thought. And that's actually where I started was trying to reinterpret Adinkra symbols. Um, in a different way. You know, now, so, what's a Dinkra symbol? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, a Dinkra symbol is um, the it's it was like a, a a pictorial language from Ghana, from the Akan people, I believe. Oh. It could be, it could be, I always get the two mixed up of Ghana. Um, so, you if you've ever seen like the Sankofa bird, that's mm-hmm. an a Dinkra symbol. Uh, oh, okay. But there's a whole bunch of them. And each symbol uh, symbolizes a different concept. Like the St. Kofa bird, uh, the meaning is uh, go back and retrieve it. So basically, uh, don't forget your past, but keep your eye on the, you know, you've got, the bird has its feet and its whole body pointing forward, but its head is, is craned backwards. So it's kind of like keeping a foot in the past uh, while looking towards the future or preparing for the future. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, so there's a whole uh, catalog of symbols. If you just if you Google it, you will see everything, and you'll say, "Oh, I've seen those before." You know, people get tattoos of it. You know, fabrics are made. You know, with it. So yeah, by the time it wasn't as prevalent as it is now, too. But that's where I, I initially got interested because these are beautiful symbols with beautiful meanings, mm-hmm. and I really wanted to explore creating something with that, having all that meaning as part of your household, which, you know, that taps into my love of interior design as well. So, yeah, so you get to Ohio, you d- which is like a natural break. I feel like anytime people move to a different place, it's like the perfect opportunity to have like that fresh start and figure out like, okay, exactly. what's next? And so <laughs> how, you know, you... We're kind of in love with the Adinkra symbol. But of course, even with that, there's a lot that you can do design wise with that. How did you like paintings and so forth? Uh, Why did you decide to go into like textiles? Being Nigerian, we have a natural history of 
textile love. I mean, <laughs> you've seen African fabrics, you know what I'm talking about. I love <laughs> that stuff. So there was all this love of textile history and uh, patterning and, you know, all that stuff that I grew up with. Mm-hmm. So, and two, if you've ever seen a Nigerian woman dress, you will know we're not afraid <laughs> of uh, We're not afraid of pattern. So naturally, you know, I I was drawn to that. And plus, fabric is a pretty low cost and low entry point way of decorating your home. Next to right. Pay. So yes, that was that was the draw. So how did you kind of pivot into that? Because I'm assuming like whenever you get into fabrics, like mm-hmm. you either have to have a special printer or access to a printer, but that's like it's whole like a whole other learning curve because it's a little bit different that's- than just traditional graphic design. So yes. how did you like educate yourself and then teach yourself to do like textile design? Well, uh, being that I'm all about like instant gratification, um, I was looking for, yeah, I wanted to find the quickest way that I could get my designs on fabric, which was to do it myself, you know, either screen printing, block printing, direct painting. So I started the uh, research screen printing, and that's actually where I started out. Is I learned how to make a screen, how to get the ink into onto it, and all that. At first, I was confused, like I didn't really understand how it worked. But I, you know, I'm a, I'm somebody that if I'm interested in something, I will pick up a book, I will research online. I don't really wait for someone to show me. Mm-hmm. I just making. I taught myself, so I just got books from the library. Um, you know, with the internet being, you know, starting to pop around that time. There was information online that I could tap into. So I I started to assemble materials and just kind of getting uh, prints on, on fabric. Um, at the time, there was no spoon flower, um, no, no way for you to kind of like mass produce your fabrics. So it was yeah. very... Wow. I know spoon flower. I'm like that came along, and I was like, "Where has this been?" That's like an amazing resource. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. I mean, because it used to be you had to like buy like a hundred yards at once, you know, if you wanted your fabric printed. But nope, not anymore. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I there were some designers that I, you know, my first um, the first designer I ever discovered doing things with fabric was uh, a lot of John's daughter. I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but uh, she's yeah. based in New York. She's actually um, Swedish, but I got her book and I was just like, oh my gosh. This is How do you spell her name? Yeah. Yeah. Her first name is Lotta, L-O-T-T-A. Mm-hmm. And last name is John's daughter, J-A-N-S-D-O-T-T-E-R. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking her up now. Yeah. Cool yeah. stuff. Okay. So, I mean, I was just like, wow, she's doing what I want to do. You know, she had <laughs> out. I actually got to meet her in 2009 at uh, Renegade Craft Fair in New York. Oh, yeah, cool. we were in New York and she was there doing some demos. So I got to meet her. I was very excited. I was fangirling. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's um, how it happens, right? Like you, when you see somebody that's doing something similar to what you want to do, you got like go and pick their yeah. brain and figure out like how they got there, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. So, you know, but I've got a couple of her books, you know, I followed her, just, you know, learned as much as I could uh, with it. And then I just, you know, experimented on my own. Uh, mm. Like I said, I go in the weeds. When I'm interested in something, I will go down uh, down the what's that from Alice in Wonderland? Oh, like the little <laughs> yellow brick road, right and like the little path. Yeah. <laughs> I would just research and do what you know. I'm like a little chemist, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I started. Um, you know, one of my friends got married, and I made her a set of sheets that I printed with the a dinker symbol for love. Mm. So, yeah, that was one of the things. Uh, but in between um, doing the soaps and transitioning to this, I also kept a blog, um, Afro Martha. Um, mm. So that was kind of like a play on Martha Stewart's name because, you know, <laughs> I was a little Susie homemaker and I was 
I was in, into decor, into cooking, into everything. So, yeah, I started uh, keeping a blog about that. So I kept that blog for about five years. It's still up. I'm just not, I don't blog on it as much as I used to. But, yeah, so that was kind of like a transition period for me. Um, and then it became pretty clear that I was really interested in this whole uh, textiles thing. Mm. So, yep, yep. So that's how I ended up here. Yeah. So you, you know, especially for people, because like some, a lot of the listeners out there might be kind of where you were several years ago, where they have this business or idea or product, and they're trying to figure out how to get it out there and right. kind of make money from it. So, mm-hmm. you know, once you kind of figured out like how to get like your beautiful designs on fabric, like how did you then sell it? Like how did you convince people like, hey, you want to buy these sheets or these pillows? <laughs> like I'm over here. Check out my cool designs like what did you do to you know um Mm -hmm. actually like put it out into the world and you know let people know that this was the direction you were taking now right um well I do a lot of shows um Mm. that's still the bulk of what I do is I started off doing like you know craft shows uh farmers markets things like that um so and you know now with the whole local movement there's no shortage of places to sell stuff. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> like farmers markets, craft fairs. Yeah. Everybody there's, wants handmade. Yeah. Exactly. There's like no shortage of, of places to, to sell it. The problem is going to be deciding which one to do. You know, that, <laughs> you know I, I have to turn down shows all the time because, too, the more I've done this, the more I've learned what will work for me and what will not. Mm. So. Mm-hmm. So that's an important uh, piece right there. But yeah, I just started off doing shows. Um, just bring my little wares, try to make this <laughs> make it the best that that I could, and people will surprisingly like pay money for stuff that you thought up thought up to do. It's like wow, okay, thanks. <laughs> like, that's <not> that, <laughs> you know. So yeah. And and how did you determine like pricing too? Because I think that's sometimes like really hard for yeah. people who do handmade items. Like sometimes they tend to like even undersell themselves, you know, when really it's like, no, like all your time has gone into making these exactly. items. So you want to make sure you price it right. So like, how did you kind of find that sweet spot of like, oh, where you're, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know it's, it's like, yeah. it's so tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Pricing is still one of those things that, you know, I, I wouldn't say I have it completely figured out because, oh boy, so much goes into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you, when you make stuff and stuff comes easy to you and you know how it's very easy for you to figure out, you, you assume that everybody can do it. And so you price it like, oh, this is just my little stuff or whatever. But yeah, it's very important to get your pricing right. And that's something that I still am learning. It's a combination of a lot of things. Of course, there's your time and your, your materials and all that. And then you also have to, the most important part is understanding what your market is. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing um, a farmer's market, and not all farmer's markets are going to be equal. Okay. So like, say, for instance, uh, in my state where I live, um, in Ohio, Mm -hmm. things tend to be lower priced. Mm. Because it's the heartland, you know, they're, they're very you no know, nonsense or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, within that, there are still pockets of places that you can price higher than yeah. you know, other places. So, the, and that's part of what I mean about figuring out what your market is. Because I can do two shows in the same town and the price uh, structure will be completely different. Because mm-hmm. if you're in a more affluent part, of course, you can charge more. Uh, and there are people that will not even buy something because it's not high enough. That's yeah, not that is so true. <laughs> it's crazy. So, um, yeah, but it's a combination of, you know, figuring out how much you want to charge per hour for your labor and then adding up all the uh, materials um that, you know, what it costs you materials 
and what it costs you in time. Um, mm-hmm. And then if you're even after you arrive at that price, it's not a simple matter of doubling or tripling or whatever. You have to look at who you're selling to. Um, mm-hmm. And that's the trickiest part because I still fall for fall into the trap of feeling like, oh, my God, um, I don't think they're going to pay that much. So let me hurry up and price it down. But what <laughs> asked me last weekend. There was a pillow that I had. It got a lot of interest online and even in person, but it didn't sell for some reason. And so at the show before last that I uh, had it at, I priced it down uh, because I I just wanted it to go. Mm -hmm. Then I, you know, I was like, nah, forget that. It took me a long time to make that. So I changed the price again. And then the show I did last weekend, I meant to price it lower but I never got around to it. But the person that bought it, he didn't even look at the price tag. He just he bought said, it. Give it to me. <laughs> he said, give it to me. Yeah. So, yeah, and it's a lot easier to make more money if you price correctly. Mm-hmm. You know, if I, if I had done what I thought about doing and priced it twenty dollars or whatever lower, I would I would have lost money on that. Yeah. You know? So pricing is still very tricky. But for me, I just recently accepted that I'm an artist. <laughs> so that's something that, ooh, that name is, ooh, carries so much. And it's, it's a lot of weight, yeah. <laughs> and with that, I've learned to look at, you know, where I'm selling, you know, uh, the markets that I'm doing. There are markets that, you know, I've gotten a lot of love and all that, but I wasn't making money and I had to make the decision to, you know, not do so many of them, not do those, you know. Mm-hmm. Cause it's, it's really about finding your audience, right? Yeah. You know, cause when I look at your, um, you know, your products, like they look very high end to me, but, yeah. but you're right. Like, let's say if your stuff was anthropology, your pillows yeah. might sell for a hundred dollars. Exactly. But if you go to like, you know, a small town, they're not going to pay more than $25 for that same exactly. pillow. Right. Exactly. And so it's because that they're just not used to paying like kind of upscale prices. So it's really finding, yeah, like it's almost like your people who like yeah. value that, that, uh, the art. Exactly. So, you know, I recently started doing more art shows than say markets, like, you know, farmers markets and things like that. And I, and I think that, that, that was a smart decision for me because yes, I need to find people who appreciate the artistic, um, integrity, I guess this is what you call, you know, yeah. people always appreciate it, but whether or not they're going to pay the money, that's a different story. Right. You know? So, right. but yeah, finding the people that value what you're doing, that goes a long way in just uh, determining, you know, if you're going to earn or not. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's the tricky thing I t- do think about art too, right? Because really it's like, it's like what speaks to people. So it's really right place at the right time sometimes, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody can see a pattern and they just fall in love. Like, oh my God, this will go perfectly in my house. I don't care what it costs. I'm going to get it. But you just That's never know when that person is going to come along. Right. right? Well, and where they're going to show up. And, and too, they say, oh, picture your ideal customer. Well, you know, sometimes you can't even do that either. Right. You know, you could say, well, my customer is uh, 30 to 45, you know, makes X amount. And then uh, a man close to 60 who's into fitness and meditation comes and says, I want that pillow. <laughs> right. You're you like, know? wait a minute. And what just like, happened? What? Uh, yeah. You just blew, you know, me completely out of the water because, you know. But yeah, the the trick is to just try to position yourself where there's a higher chance of the people that you think are going to buy. So how many <laughs> years have you been doing this now? So about maybe seven years? Well, um, yeah, I'd say about seven years. The initial idea came up, you know, well, no. <laughs> I started being more serious about it about four years ago. Okay. You know, because like I said, you know, I've been in and out of, oh, I need to get a job. Oh, my God. You know, <laughs> right. I have to get a job and be completely miserable. And, yeah. <laughs> so I got really serious about four years ago. But, yeah, I've been doing it 
for seven to eight years now. Now, do you do it full time right now or do you balance this with a full time job? Nope. I do this um, full time. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it's. It, yeah, it, it it can be hard. That uh, <laughs> life is, is not, you know, it's not all roses. It's not like, oh, you know, everybody thinks, wow, you're working for yourself. Yeah, you are. And overall, I am happy doing that. But it's not always easy. And that's the thing. Most entrepreneurs you talk to, they will tell you they quit like every other day. <laughs> it's not easy, you know, but I've done enough to know that this is where I want to be. Right. You know, so. And two, I'm like, where, where am I going to fit a job? My kids, you know, they have things that need to be done. And even though they're in school during the day, but then after after school, you've got, oh, this person needs to go here. This person's mm-hmm. got this appointment. This person want, has track practice. And mm-hmm. this person has to go to work, you know. So you're just like balancing like 500 things. And I usually don't go to bed till like about one in the morning and I have to be right back up at 6 30. Yeah. So gotta take the kids to school and I go for my morning walks then I come home uh, do some work then you know my husband goes to work and then the afternoon running around yeah so it's a it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot <laughs> Well, yeah, and I think people sometimes don't realize too because they see a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, artists that are entrepreneurs. And they're like, "Oh my God, it's so amazing how they they get to like design and whatever all day." But it's like, no, you also have to like market and try to get press yes. and like take photos. There's like the the not so sexy side of yes. like right, well, being your like- own boss. One thing I absolutely detest is paperwork, but that's a huge <laughs> part of it. I, in fact, um, I have on my story right now, you know, paperwork is the, you know, is the necessary evil, you know, because <laughs> I have contracts that need to go out and I'm just like, oh God, I have to fill out forms. Why? <laughs> you, know, you know, so there's, there's that whole side of it, which I'd rather just be making stuff, but... Yeah, you can't just make stuff. You got to do the the part that makes itself. You know? Right. Yeah. N- now, that. how I I see on your website that um you offer wholesale orders and then you even have like a page where people can get custom design work too. So mm-hmm. how um has that side of the business been? Um are you still growing it or do you do pretty yeah, good? That's- you know, that's not, that side's not even totally fleshed out yet, but I, I have done custom work, uh, for people and that's always really fun because, you know, then they get exactly what they want. They usually just tell me the colors, um, the way I work, I'm not someone that's going to sit down and totally sketch out everything. I work very in the moment a lot, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, I have to train myself to to work to for with reproduction in mind, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that that part is you know something I'm wanting to build. I'm working to build more with interior designers, um, so that I you know I can do more custom work, and that will generate more you know more revenue. But it may not be uh, a steady stream. But mm-hmm. yeah, it, you know, I feel like that's where it's at for me is working directly with uh, people and their designers or and or, you know, and then with the wholesale, I've done wholesale. In fact, um, I have a few things that are local Whole Foods. So that's one of my uh, wholesale. Oh, cool. Yeah. Very um, cool. Yeah, it's, it's been really awesome. But I have with making everything by hand, sometimes it gets tricky. Yeah. Uh, you know, Cause you're like, uh, cause you got to keep in mind what they can sell it for. Mm-hmm. And you know, you have to, you, you're generally going to take about half of that. Right. So it's always, it yeah. To, 50%. Yeah. Yeah. And it has to be high enough of a price that you can be okay with half. Mm-hmm. You know, and doing everything yourself, sometimes that's really hard, especially, like I said, where I live in my immediate market. Um, they're not they're not used to paying like really high prices for things like that. 
Now, have you ever thought about like even selling your patterns? Yes. Um, funny enough, that's where I started. Like, oh, I'm going to be a surface designer, you know? Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I just haven't really taken the time to really market that part of it. Because, mm, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's no clear path of how to do that. A lot of times, um, you know, there's one of several ways. Um, there are agents that you can work with that will sell your pattern. The biggest thing you can probably do is go to a trade show, like in New York, uh, Surtex is a big one. Um, there's a few other print stores, you know, really just licensing your work. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the way that generally goes, you can either license or sell it outright. But, you know, I have not really figured out how to do that successfully. Um, for one thing, surtex is woo, <laughs> a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah, uh, it's like a gamble, right? Like it's yeah. an investment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and like I said, the way I work, I'm very like in the moment and I <laughs> really enjoy dealing directly with, uh, the, the, the public though, you know, I'm sort of an introvert. So it takes a lot of energy for me to go out there and interact, but I do like it and I do like the immediate, the immediacy of it. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, that, that, that is definitely something that I, you know, I'm willing to do because of course I can't print fabric by hand forever. So. (laughs) <laughs> right. I mean, because even I, I figure like sometimes it's like that balance, right? It's like you continue to make things by hand because you have a love for it. But mm-hmm. then also like diversifying like your income, because if okay. let's say if somebody did pick up or pay, pay to license your patterns, that's like making money while you sleep. Right. So it's yeah. like another way to to make money without you actually having to, I guess, like physically do something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that, you know, that's something that I really consider. I'm like, oh, in my dream, somebody will come <laughs> on Instagram and say, hey, how about you let us use your back? Well, you know what? You never know because you do hear stories about those big companies discovering people, yeah. you know, so you never know. But sometimes you do have to, like, put yourself out there, too. Yeah. But your patterns are absolutely gorgeous. So I, I, you know, it's probably just, you know, it's just being discovered, right? Like, right. getting it in front of the right people. Exactly. And, yeah, I'm working towards that. But, you know, there's the the not... So not a sexy way of doing it, which is to really like get someone and pound that pavement and submit your pattern <laughs> to different places. There's that way. And then the romantic, oh, I just, they just fell in love with my stuff online. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know, right? That's like the very, <laughs> that happens to a very small percentage. A very people. small, <laughs> very small percentage. <laughs> yeah. Now, so. do you do classes? Yes, I have actually done a few and I was, I need to do more. So I'm going to be scheduling one here very shortly. Um, you know, it's always fun. Um, I've done like block printing classes. Yeah. Where you make your own block and, and print something with it, you know, but there's a whole lot of um, other ideas that I have as far as different uh, classes go. But yep. Just need to nail down location, pick a date, and it'll be on again. Yeah, but that's time consuming too, right? Because that's like you know, it takes several hours out of the day. You got to like put the oh. class together, but well, but, but it seems I, like it'd be a fun class. Like I, I wish I was oh, in Ohio, I'd sign up for it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really fun, especially when you have people who are into it. One thing I've um, done that wasn't really. I guess it was sort of part of my business or not, but I taught like um, art classes to high school students in, in the summer. Mm, uh, mm-hmm. which, uh, I have a background as a teacher as well, a little, a little bit. Um, so I did these, um, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Upward Bound. Yes, uh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, they had, they offered an elective um, for art. And that was so fun because, you know, they, I just pick things that, you know, teenagers would like. They, they, they really like emojis. And they really <laughs> like, uh, you know, just 
kitschy little things like that. So we would do that. So that that was fun. Um, that wasn't part of like printmaking really, mm-hmm. but it was something creative that was outside of the usual um, structured art thing. But yeah, I like doing fun little uh, workshops like that. Um, oh, very cool. Well, I just have a few wrap up questions. Okay. Um, the first question is, uh, have you discovered your passion? And if so, what is it? Yes, um, I think I have. Um, and it fits a little bit into my business. Um, what I'm really passionate about is uh, solving creative problems. So <laughs> I will invent the problem just so I can solve it. No, no. <laughs> but, but I love trying to find out uh, a unique perspective on something. You know, there's the standard way to do it. And then there's this other way that I figured out because I'm, I'm really good at being able to look at um, relationships between two disparate uh, items and figure out, okay, this connects to this. I can use this item in a different way, you know? Um, so that's what I really love to do. I just don't know how I would ever make money at that, but yeah, I, I, just <laughs> love, I love creative problem solving. Yeah. Than, yeah. Very cool. And then um, what's one thing that you can't live without? It could be anything in the world. <laughs> uh, besides the obvious of my phone. Um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, I love avocados. I just really do. If avocados were ever to be <laughs> got rid of, we'd have a serious problem. You'd be like, where are my avocados? Avocados yeah. are good. <laughs> yes, I, I will eat them with anything. So, yeah. <laughs> and then where can the listeners find you? Please let them know your website and any social media handles you'd uh, like them to have. Sure. Um, my website, I have two actually, um, which is the first one is my name, yetunderodriguez.com. Um, that's it. You know, that's kind of is shaping up to be like my portfolio site. And then there's the uh, my shopping site, which is YR Design yrdsgn.com mm. so it looks like yard sign but it's not <laughs> that. it's yr design is what it's supposed to say but then it's like hmm, that looks like it says yard sign so um i'm sure you you might have this in the show notes i'm not sure but um, absolutely and then on instagram which is where i practically live it's uh yay tune day it's y-a-y-t-o-o-n-d-a-y it's like the phonetic spelling of my name, Yay Tune Day. Mm-hmm. Um, and same thing on Twitter, though I'm not on Twitter as much, but I do have a presence on there. And Facebook, my business page is uh, Yay Tune Day Rodriguez Design. Well, Yay Tune Day, thank you so much um, for coming on to the show. Lots of great tips, and uh, you know, I'm sure you're going to inspire some other graphic and textile artists out there to just put themselves out there and just start and get going. Thank um, you. So, <laughs> thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's been a, it's been my pleasure. Well, that's a wrap, folks. This is the season two opener. I hope that uh, you found her as inspiring as I have. I'll just say one thing, like one of uh, the quotes that I pulled out from this episode is she said, most entrepreneurs you talk to, uh, they will tell you they quit like every other day. And I think that's so true because you might love what you're doing, but because of the administrative work or just like you have a tough day and you still have to like get the work done, you're just like, why am I doing this? And I feel like that's if you're a full-time entrepreneur or if you're doing something on the side, but you just kind of like push through it. So for those of you out there that are like, why am I doing this? It's because you love it. So keep doing it, okay? Anyway. If you guys want to get any of the links that she mentioned, like the Spoon Flower, the Lotta Jen's Daughter, Surtex, Print Source, like even the Upper Bound program she mentioned, I'll have it in the show notes along with like her website, like utundayrodriguez.com, which has like some of the other links she mentioned, but those will also be in the show notes over at nishaysnow.com slash 32. 
All right. And if you guys could do me a favor right now, right now, please head on over to iTunes and give me a five star rating since I'm just starting season two and I'm um, knocking the dust off, if you will, because I've, I've been dormant for two months. I need iTunes to recognize I'm back on. So if you guys go over there and give me a five star ratings and if you want to like put in a nice comment, that will really help me. It'll help, um, you know, with iTunes kind of like recognizing that, um, that I'm back. All right. It's a little thing, but it it does a lot. All right, you guys, uh, have an amazing morning, noon, and night. I have another amazing guest next week, and I look forward to talking to you guys again. See ya. (laughs) 